Our next panel of experts will delve into how companies can and are navigating our new reality to continue, maintain, and even grow. Introducing Scott Taylor, Jonathan Smalley, Ashley Crowder, John Bree, and Jeff Nicholson on the future of marketing, the quarantine age. Hey, thanks, Hubes. How you doing? Thank you. Doing great. You hanging tough? Hanging tough. Hanging in there. Thanks Very for being nice. here. Great backdrop. Good job. <laughs> I'm setting my timer. Technology at its best. Do we have everybody on? Let's see. Jonathan Smalley. He's here. John Bree, I see. Ashley's here. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Nicholson. I guess that's who we're waiting for. Give him a minute. Ashley, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Excellent. I'm fired up. I like that yeah. backdrop. Is that a custom Adi shoe? Uh, yeah. So that's actually a 3D model created with our software. So it's not a photo. Really cool. All CGI. Wow. I'm actually not even in, in this place right now. Um, you can't even, this is like a hologram. Yeah, yeah. I brought, I brought some fun snap filters. So these oh. are 3D glasses. <laughs> we just we made killed these it. Too. <laughs> yeah, that's found so far, by far. I've got lots of tricks. <laughs> um, so, hey, John Bree, how you doing? If I was any better, it would be a crime. All right, don't get arrested now, man. We might, you know, take it easy. Jonathan? You got your mute off? He's having some sound issues. He's calling in. Is he? All right. You kids, you know, I'm the geezer here. Yeah, I'm the, this guy shouldn't have any problems with technology. I was getting ready to call in on a rotary phone. There you go. Well, I, I, until we were waiting for uh, Jeff to get on, I just wanted you to know, I sent you guys some questions on your hands. And, oh, you got it, Jonathan? You're good? Jeff's here. No, well, that's Jeff. <laughs> no, Jeff is here now. All right, yep. listen. I sent you guys a bunch of questions. And I'm not going to ask you any of those. We actually had some researchers go do some deep diving into your past. So we're going to talk about your childhood first. And it might get really <laughs> uncomfortable, uh, but it's not personal. And after this conference is over, no one's going to know. Like, they won't remember. All right? I don't know. I, I really can't speak 100% to the accuracy of the information that I was, that I was given about what you guys have, have been through. Um, mm -hmm. But... We're not going to ask those questions. I'm going to start out with some of these, though. Did I get you a little nervous? Did you know I'm <laughs> Yeah, I know. Here's the icebreaker. I'm going to go to you first, John. I want you to think of somebody that's no longer living that you really admire and what that person would be telling you right now. What kind of advice would they be giving you through this unprecedented time? Oh, it would be my father. And he would have said, shake it off take a deep breath, and get back in the game. Good advice. What about you, Ashley? Who would that person be, and what would they tell you? Yeah, so I thought of Ada Lovelace, uh, the first person to write an algorithm for the modern computer. So she just thought of the first computer programmer. And I think she would say, you know, disasters give opportunity to invention. So take advantage of this time to create. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I would go with my uh, grandmother, my, aka Nana, uh, and she would tell me to uh, be relentless. Uh, the woman was born in 1915, lived till she was 101, uh, and her, her motto was very simple, be relentless regardless of what's going on around you. You know, that's, it's amazing too. You know, we, we've never really been through anything like this, and this is probably nothing like the Great Depression or any of these other things, but we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. Um, how about, uh, who are we missing? Uh, Jonathan, is he, has he left us? Nope. I guess he's not here. No, he's there. He just doesn't have any sound. Oh, all right. Well, listen, I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to my next question. Um, Ashley, what surprised you about yourself and the way you've processed the last month or so and going forward in this Corona issue? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the type of person where everything hits me after the fact. I go into solve mode and I think I'm still in solve mode. <laughs> um, I, I think pleasantly surprised by the genuineness of everyone. I feel like I've become much more closer with my employees, my vendors, and even my customers. We're just having honest conversations. That's great. What about you, John? What surprised you about the way you're processing this? That I have uh, unlimited patience with those that have moved quickly into panic mode. Mm. That's going to lead into my next question. Real, real quick, I just, do you have enough mustache wax to, to last the next month or two? You know, I, I, I haven't used it in a while, but the old hairdryer works good. All right, good deal. Want to make sure. Hey, um, Jeff, what about you? What surprised you about yourself and how you've been processing this whole thing? Uh, probably the biggest thing is I miss the airport more than I realized. Uh, I used to <laughs> traveling quite a bit. So uh, I very much miss Pete's Coffee and Terminal 4. And uh, I miss traveling. But outside of that, you know, I, I try to keep pretty, pretty even keel. Right. I don't know how Huberman's putting up with it. The guy is, you know, <laughs> uh, he's on the road all the time. And uh, he's been around. And I, I think all of us have probably experienced, like, being present, you know, when we're running things, we're usually running around multitasking. Now we've been able to be more present. So I think that's a positive thing. Um, and and uh, John, you're kind of alluding to this, but my next question is, uh, what's caused you the most aggravation since you've been a part of this thing, Ashley? Um, Zoom not working all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like all of a sudden, everyone's on the internet and it's, uh, like not being able to communicate when I want to communicate is extremely difficult. <laughs> right. With all the technology that we have, it's like the weakest link. And yet there's all these software companies, all this technology around it. And then it just keeps like kind of breaking no matter who you are. Uh, it's, it's really wild. Okay. What about you, John? What aggravates you the most? I think it's the same thing. I think it's the, the fact that no one ever prepared for this completely. And we've been talking about it for a while. And, you know, experts have been talking about it. I, I think we needed to just get, better with the, the whole concept of remote and uh you know work from home it was never tested to this extreme so that's that's it's frustrating right jeff i'd say the underappreciation for human connection and energy um i think a lot of people are trying to say you know obviously the world's going to change and i appreciate that but at the same point you can't replace being in a room with someone and exchanging communication and energy um there's nothing that's going to replace you know, this is not nearly the connection level that you and I could potentially have in person. So I also want people to not swing too far the other way uh, and talk about how everyone's going to live on Zoom either, because that's just unrealistic. Right. I, as you were telling me that, I just started thinking of all these crowds of millions of people like running at each other and hugging each other, right? Like there's going to be this crazy like suction to just hold people that you don't even know, right? The random strangers, that's gonna be trippy, man. It, it's gonna be really wild to, to watch and see and see what happens. All right, the, the, the last question before we get into the meat potatoes, which could be potentially the most important question and the one question that's on everybody's mind, and be careful how you answer this, um, Ashley, but um, did Carol Baskin kill her first husband? <laughs> I'm really on the fence about that. You are. I'm really excited for apparently there's a sequel. We're going to be able to dig deeper. How mind boggling is Tiger King? Uh, Unbelievable. Uh, mind -boggling. Uh, just, it, it was incredible and it was exactly what the quarantine needed. <laughs> yeah. And so it, would we consider, would we consider Tiger King like the phenomena of Uggs or like Crocs or something? <laughs> like it just showed up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it's, I, there's no words. It's there's no words. Jeff, <laughs> Carol Baskin, kill her first husband or not? A hundred percent. You do? hundred percent? Yeah, hundred percent. Just in your gut? There's John. <laughs> All right. Jonathan. Jonathan's back, buddy. I'm here. You, you yes, came thanks. into the big, Sorry about that, guys. big question. I got here for the most important thing. Yeah. Right. Carol Baskin, <laughs> kill her first husband or not? Yeah, unequivocally, yeah. Unequivocally. John, you watch Tiger King? No, I don't, but I can tell you after all the years of experience, she probably, he probably deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. I love that. All right, here we go. You guys ready for some serious questions here? All right, um, Ashley, I'm going to go to you. Well, actually, no, Jonathan, I'll go to you first because you've been kind of MIF for a second. How is your company benefiting from the massive amount of user volume online the past month? 
and how is it benefiting you or your customers or clients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting time. Obviously, something we're, we're trying to approach like thoughtfully and not be like ambulance chaser about it. Um, you know, I think for us, it, it, it's data, right? Um, my fellow data friend, Jeff, and I talk about all the time, like, like you can just find so many answers in data and with more people coming online, especially what we see across our platform is, you know, you go from maybe multi-channel and wholesale down to a single channel and everyone's being funneled there. And all of a sudden, you know, you go from not understanding half of your data to understanding everything. Um, and so I think obviously it's a really hard time, but it's a, it's a real opportunity to be able to understand, you know, customer and, and, and have like kind of a holistic picture, at least for this, like, you know, short snapshot of time. Right. Just, it seems like there's so many people right now that are online that it would have taken so much longer, you know, so many more months to get the accumulation of data and interactions that people are having online with these brands and these storytelling. So uh, before I, before I go ask the, um, ask you, Ashley, go down the road. I want to do a quick introduction because uh, I, was, I was waiting a little bit. But we've got Jonathan Smalley, the CEO of Yaguara, John Bray, Chief Risk Officer uh, of Supply Wisdom, Jeff Nicholson, CEO of Tracer, a uh, Vayner Media Company, I believe, and Ashley Crowder, CEO and co founder of uh, Vitana. Okay, just to give everybody caught up on that. So, uh, Ashley, back to you. Um, the question was, you know, how are companies benefiting from the massive amount of user volume, the amount of all the people that are online right now? What are you seeing or what are your customers seeing or what should they expect? Yeah, I mean, I, we're, I'm seeing amazing things like this. This is a really thought, well thought out um, virtual conference today. What I think I'm seeing too much of is if I get one more webinar on the SBA loans, I think, you know, huh. if you're a bank, yes, you should be doing that. If you're not a bank, I don't want your advice on that. <laughs> you know, so I, so I think it's making sure people are uh, sticking to who they are as a brand and giving good content for for them. So from Ventana's standpoint, we help create 3D models of products. You know, digital content is king right now, and and we're looking to connect with people and try and help people do that better, do that faster, because digital is the only way to connect with people. Right. Um, but but being respectful of are you still in panic solve mode as a retailer? Okay, let's touch base, you know, in an, in a couple of weeks, just trying to be really open and, and fair to where people are at right now. Right. And Jeff, um, you know, you're, we are I think CMO of VaynerMedia. Um, we're watching CPMs come down. I think the last report I saw 20, 30%. We're seeing massive crowds online all day surfing where they normally wouldn't. Hopefully, you know, they were just smoking cigarettes on the loading dock from time to time. But now, you know, these people are just mob scening uh, the internet. You know, how are you guys taking advantage of that? How are the brands taking advantage that you think now? Yeah, I mean, I think on the on the Vayner side, to your point, there's opportunity for brands to continue to speak to the attention that consumers have on their mobile phones, right? If you think about usage, whether it's streaming services or on just classic mobile devices, you have a greater opportunity to get someone's attention at a lower price. Um, now, I think you have to do that, you know, to Jonathan's point around being respectful and cautious and, and appreciative of the uniqueness of the moment. Um, and then on the tracer side for us, it's just helping people automate um, and find new ways to do things with data. Um, I think the, the nice thing and the push for us in, in, in kind of the, the ecosystem is just, I think, a new level of appreciation in regards to data usage and, and understanding consumers at a deeper level because, you know, people don't move as quickly as they have to. They just move as quickly as they're told. And John, what's your uh, feedback? How are companies benefiting from this, this phenomena that we're seeing right now? How are you guys benefiting we're in the risk intelligence business and we do real-time continuous risk intelligence covering both companies and, and jurisdictions, cities and countries. So we've been kind of preaching this for quite a while now about the importance of having real-time intelligence and information that allows you to not only make decisions, but adjust your decisioning as things change. So we cover everything from financial risk, cyber, governance, regulatory, people, solutions. Uh, when we get into countries, uh, we we reported on uh, the, the COVID-19 on January 2nd when it was still considered a flu. Uh, so we cover geopolitical risk, legal, business, financial in, in a jurisdiction. And what we're doing is we're giving people the information they need to be able to adapt quickly. 
Yeah, so this is a big this is a big time for you guys. I mean, this is obviously I'm gonna lead into another question, John. Okay. I'm gonna start out with you this time, which is basically were you and your company prepared to have everybody work at home? And and if yes, what did you do? And if not, what are companies struggling with right now? What are they what are they at risk for? Well, we were prepared because we've been operating this way for God, the last probably four or five years. Um, you, because we're located uh, overseas, we have to cover multiple time zones. So we do that a lot with people working from home. So they've been equipped and prepared. The challenge that we're hearing is that, and it's not basically in the U.S. as much, but when you start to get into some of the countries where service providers are located in India and Asia and, and, and parts of Europe, they don't have the infrastructure. Not everybody had a laptop. You know, when you're a thousand people working at a, a yeah. site in, in Mumbai, you may not have a laptop to go home and fire it up. So that was the challenge. Nobody was prepared for this demand of remote. Right. Uh, I think it right. follows what Ashley said is that, you know, the network's not always going to be there. Absolutely. Hey, Jeff, what about you guys? Were you guys prepared? Did you do a bunch of, uh, you know, people working from home remotely? Yeah, I mean, I think we were uniquely positioned given that we're engineering company. So a majority of my employees are, are used to and actually prefer to work from home. I mean, we're 80 percent engineers. Um, so for us, it was it was less of a shift than I think most verticals or industries. Um, but still something that you can't, again, can't replace team time and dynamic in the office with everybody. But I do think we were probably better prepared than most, luckily. Cool. Ashley, do you think people are digging working from home or do you think they're going to be missing the office? And how did you guys respond to it? Did everybody kind of snap to right away or, you know, have you been struggling with trying to keep people engaged? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, we're, we're mostly an engineering team as well. So everyone had a laptop. We, we were kind of set up from the beginning. Um, something that we do, we, we've always done a, a Wednesday morning team meeting, which used to be a breakfast meeting, but we're still doing that virtually. And our team has been really creative with finding different um, games to play virtually. Um, there, there's a lot out there now, like Quiplash is a great one, uh, but we take 30 minutes out of the day and play some of these fun games as a team and it just helps kind of get that face time with people. Do you guys do dress up yet? Have you guys done any of those things? We've like, not done dress up, camera? but uh, at, with the snap lens, everyone on my team has created their own snap lenses at this point, so. Cool. cool. Um, I, I know a lot of companies out there are wondering, you know, how do I remain relevant? You know, what, what do I do? Why is my company uniquely positioned today? And I would ask, um, Jonathan, I'll go to you, you. How does your company remain relevant right now and make the cut with buyers trying to decide the must haves, you know, for their arsenal right now? Like this is a, a CEOs, founders, you know, you don't have to be a brand new company, but you're really trying to figure out what kind of powder do I keep trying? Where do I spend it and not panic and like fade out? So why do you think your company's relevant and is a must have, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think at the high level for us, the, the relevancy is kind of what we've been talking about. Like this, the, the it's more important than ever before that to leverage data well and, and to make database decisions. And then, you know, I, I think in terms of like what that looks like tactically is like one kind of like speed over over almost everything else. Like it's the time to like like you guys did put together a conference really quickly and, and help provide people value. You know, we're getting ready to roll out a program where we're giving like our top tier customer support and, and coaching um, essentially away at like our bottom tier pricing. And so I think it's the, the way you stay relevant is by like having assumptions on what relevant is, putting it into the market and, and seeing if you're providing people like a real value. And if you are, then like, great, do more of that. And if you're not like change tactics. And so I think, you know, we this whole thing is, is about an unprecedented time and there's no like you know, there's no magic bullet. It's about uh, understanding the value that your company brings. I think like what are those core tenants of your business and then what are unique ways for you to deliver that into the market? Right, thanks. Hey, Jeff, why, why are you guys super relevant right now? Uh, honestly, I think we, we add value when most take away in the supply chain. Um, when you think about decreasing cost, increasing speed and then increasing performance, we sit in kind of the nice triangle as I say. And so, you know, I feel we're a very defendable business model. Um, we're actually invite only, so we won't take a client unless we feel like it's mutual beneficial. Um, and, and I think we sit in a very strong position in business intelligence, and we built a business that was based on adding value and being profitable, as opposed to, I think a lot of people get over leveraged. And then in times of need or in times of difficulty, um, they fold like a lawn chair. So I think that 
you know, really when you build a strong foundation of your business, you can weather the storm a lot better than other people. True that. Absolutely. Ashley, you know, you guys are part of this virtual experience. So, I mean, you guys got to be licking your chops right now in spite of a lot of things that are going on that people could be bummed out about. How are you taking advantage of this opportunity right now? Yeah, I mean, b before COVID, we had already started seeing the, the change. You know, in, in the 80s, we went from film to digital. And now we're in this digital to CGI change happening with content. Um, and COVID is now really just speeding up the need for that. Um, so for, for us, we're really just promoting more of what we do. So many people knew us as the hologram events company, which is where we started. And obviously that business is, can't do anything right now, but all the software we use to create that content today can be used on web and AR. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're happy to work with people today and specifically with COVID going on, we're happy to do the first couple 3D models for free just so you can see what's possible and, and trying to make things um, easy for people to try right now when they don't necessarily want to invest in a brand new technology. Gotcha. Hey, John, so how are you getting your message out right now? I mean, security is an important thing. Risk, obviously, people are trying to measure that real time. What are you guys doing to try to get in front of these companies that need your services? Well, we're, we're, we're well known in the industry and we, you know, we do a lot on LinkedIn. Because you, you don't know how well known you are. Well, huh. we're reasonably well known that's in our industry, in our statement. industry. That's a pretty puffy statement. I'll be honest with you. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. No, what I, I accept that. I mean, I'm well known. I mean, the rest of them are. But, <laughs> uh, no, I think what's happening is that, you know, because we we're putting a lot out on LinkedIn, we use that as a medium. Um, we've, we've actually we have a very sophisticated alert program where we curate all our data. So there's no such thing as a false positive. But uh, what, what's nice about it is we've actually put them up on our website. So all our COVID-19 alerts, which people pay for in the past, we have them up on our website for free. That's great. So, so we're doing that. And we're encouraging people, you know, n not to panic, to make good sound decisions and use the information that's being updated every day to help you make those best decisions. Gotcha. Um, okay. Plan B. How did your company react? I, I, I want to know a lot of people that are listening to this went through like I was in Boston and New York on my way back to the office visiting our offices in our new offices in New York and Boston. And this thing started dribbling out like it's a real serious thing. I'm an optimist. I'm a go getter. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm like, ah, you know, it's a flu. We'll get through it. Blah, blah, blah. Like a lot of people. And then, you know, everybody was like, whoa, this is, this is way different than that. Mm -hmm. And then people had to shift. I was really fortunate to watch, you know, look, I'm a geezer. I'm 56 years old. Huberman's like some kid. I think he's like 15 or 16 years old. He runs this company. His attitude was super positive. I mean, this is where you make your bones as a leader and, and, and as an entrepreneur. And it was really impressive for me. And I hope he's eating lunch or something. Now I'm not listening. So I don't want to get too big of a head, but you know, his attitude and Tony um, Del Mercado, the leaders of the company kind of went to plan B right away. And the plan B was, you know, doing what we have to do in our industry. Ashley, what was your plan B? How did you act? How did you get your leaders together uh, to, to come up with a unified front? Yeah, I mean, we immediately had a meeting um, with the leadership, looked at contingency plans. What if this lasts six months? What if this lasts eight months? How is that going to affect the business? How can we solve for this? And, and made a decision that day. And we had a meeting with the team and said, you know, this is the decision moving forward. We are 100% focused on our software business. We are a soft, pure software company now. This is how we're gonna implement and focus. And these are all the changes that are happening today. And we made sure it was a one day announcement. So people weren't worried about trickle changes happening throughout the weeks. We said, we, we don't want you to be worried that at any moment a new announcement can come. Like this is our decision. This is what we're doing. This is the new plan to make it very clear. Cool. Jonathan, anybody surprise you? Anybody in the leadership crack and like go in the corner and suck their thumb and hold their blankie? Like what, what did your leadership do? Uh, I won't give up Chad here, but probably <laughs> crying in the corner for sure. Um, no, I, I, you know, I, I think kind of what I said earlier, I think you go back to the core tenets of, you know, it's really easy to try to, you know, want to make decisions out of fear or, you know, it's hard to make a strategy for something that's unknown. And so I think we tried to go back to uh, the things that we kind of hold to, you know, be true regardless of the situation is why are we doing what we're doing? Do we still really believe in 
in like in that mission and in the people who are delivering on it and like what are the initial steps that we can take to keep moving those things forward in uncertain times and so you know i think for us it's it's an ongoing conversation and you know i think it's easy to as like a business leader to freak out and, and that's where you have to keep going back to those tenants and um you know no strategy that's enacted now is going to be perfect and so just how can we iterate and, and learn so you really guys quickly. just kind of regrouped again litmus test gut check kept going after it jeff what what did you start drinking when all this stuff hit the fan and then how did your team react and what are they drinking right now uh so i'm i'm an irish guy from boston so i drink anything that's available the number one rule um <laughs> and then you know, honestly what we focused on was the team i wanted to make sure that all my team members were safe and healthy and had the the things they needed to be comfortable um in order to just honestly live their lives and then second of all with them we would focus on the business but the biggest thing for Leighton, my co-founder and myself, was to make sure that the team was just okay um, and make sure that they felt comfort in their home and then also uh, reassure them that the business is just going to be just fine and be consistently transparent and make sure that they know that they can call me anytime and ask questions to make sure that they either want an injection of energy and positivity or just reassurance that the business is going to continue to foster, you know, success. Sweet. Hey, John, you're, you're a risk guy. So like, do you think most companies have a plan B sitting there in queue waiting to like engage or do you think everybody kind of like the panel just had to improvise and, and change? I think everyone had a plan B, but the plan B wasn't going to be, uh, wasn't prepared for this kind of a situation. So I think that plan B went out the window. Uh, what happened is, for example, we just ver immediately verified that all our employees were safe and secure and had what they needed. We contacted all of our customers. I mentioned earlier, we put our alerts up for free. We do daily attestations and, and we're investing in the company to grow it because this is a, there's a demand. But I think a lot of companies have are now realizing that, you know, we all use words, especially on the development side of agile and DevOps and all these things, all the risk plans and all the pre preparation plans have to also be agile. Yeah. You have to be ready to change on a dime. Great point. Great point. We're, we got a couple minutes left. I want to ask real quick, uh, Ashley, give me three verticals that you think are like no brainers that are benefiting from where we're at right now. Yeah, well, I think augmented reality, virtual reality and, and digital content. Huge. You know, okay. I social VR. I met people in a bar last Wednesday night virtually. It's very Take fun. It easy. Take <laughs> it easy. Hey, Jonathan, what about you? Top three verticals. Yeah, I mean, I think looking at a lot of data that we see from across our platform and outside of that, you know, specifically in e-commerce, I think there's been some funny ones like sales of bread makers have gone up. It's interesting to see just like cooking at home. So that's one. Um, I'd say CBD and hemp. That's another big one that we've seen an increase of. You've got to figure out ways to stay calm. And then obviously just like massive jumps in, in home goods. And I think it's going to be interesting to see you know, how our paradigms change of, you know, right. going down the street versus now like having a toilet, you know, a toilet paper subscription. Yeah, my, my uh, daughter's boyfriend just subscribed to some bamboo toilet, you know, paper delivery company. They're killing it. John, what about you? Top three verticals. Uh, obviously risk intelligence, I think. Uh, obviously well, risk intelligence. Obviously risk intelligence. <laughs> the whole world of crisis management is gonna change because people are gonna need help with developing programs and, and, um, when this is all over and we settle down, I heard somebody say that there are going to be a lot more babies and a lot more divorces. So I think lawyers and doctors are going I, to do great. Absolutely thinking that way too. How many babies are going to be coming around in November, December timeframe? Uh, nobody said sex toys. We, we've done some research. We've, sex toys is bl <laughs> blowing up right now. It's insane. I can't believe it. Um, and people just shop. People like to shop. They're bored. They're home. We, you know, we brought on 50 new brands last month, which was crazy. You know, our plan B at Hawk Media was like, hey, we're, we're a digital marketing agency. We're growing yep. really fast. W anything can happen. Are people just going to shut down? Or are people going to get after it? And, you know, we watched people kind of pause for a second. And then we watched people getting online. Obviously, we know that now, almost a month later. But people are engaged. Um, I, I do sense optimism. I sense that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I think leadership plays such a crucial role right now. And I'm really thankful that you guys decided to take some time right on the on the fly and join our our conference really appreciate your time your input hopefully it hasn't been too tedious dealing with me and uh i thank you very much i thank your companies and participation i'll kick it back to uh the fearless leader of hawk media eric huberman 
Thanks. I, I, I got to be honest. I just completely lost it when you asked Jeff what he's drinking. But well done. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. <laughs>